Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is Kelly Harris with Bright Talk, and I'm joined by Jeannie Moraine, um, who's author and speaker um, of the I Speak Cloud uh, series. Jeannie, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Kelly. So um, before we get started, everybody, um, wanted to do a couple quick intros. So um, this webinar is part of our Ask the Expert series on Bright Talk. Um, that is a weekly series where each week we're interviewing a different expert in a different field or industry. Um, so Jeannie is a digital transformation and cloud computing expert, and today we're going to be talking about licensing as a service. So we'll be doing um, more of a technical deep dive into that in just a few minutes here. So um, a little bit about myself. I am a senior global content strategy manager at Bright Talk. I oversee our IT infrastructure and enterprise architecture community. Um, so that includes cloud computing, data center management, um, storage, virtualization, network infrastructure, um, and everything in regards to digital transformation. So it's a pretty all-encompassing um, community on our platform. Um, I do manage the community globally, so um, we have offices here in San Francisco, um, in California, as well as an office over in London in the UK. Um, so we work with clients, speakers, and thought leaders from all over the world. Um, so today, if you want to get involved, um, please feel free to use the hashtag AskTheExpert. Um, you can tweet at me, at Kelly H. Community. Um, you can tweet at Jeannie, at Jeannie Moraine. Um, and also, please feel free to submit questions through the questions box. Um, and we'll be sure to address those um, throughout the webinar as they come through. Um, you can also send feedback and ratings. Um, so if you do have any feedback for us, or if you want to get involved in the series, please feel free to send those through as well. So Jeannie, go ahead and um, give a little bit of background about yourself. That would be great. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur. What that means is that I have been involved in multiple uh, startups, uh, several that have been acquired, such as Marimba from BMC Software for the market vision for something called business service management as well as to install from VMware for the market vision called, uh, called Universal Client, uh, which led to virtual desktop infrastructure and a lot of what they call the universal platform today. Um, I focus on being a catalyst, um, helping people create a go-to-market strategy for new products, um, for new tech categories uh, from inception to launch. So really understanding the problems that people are facing by those signing the checks and using uh, products in production and then helping them solve them. Um, I am an author and a blogger as well. Uh, that's what I do to give back. So I've written five books on the topic, um, starting back from 2006 with um, Malcolm Fry, uh, to my latest one that was sponsored by HPE, uh, you know, ISP Cloud Embracing Digital Transformation. I'm also a guest blogger on DevOps Digest, VM Blog, Virtual Strategy Magazine, HPE Business uh, Insights, and Tech Beacon. And then I've been a keynote speaker at several uh, industry events, um, you know, from I International Association of IT Asset Managers to uh, uh, ET Exchange, as well as uh, keynotes with some pretty interesting folks like Michael Phelps. And um, finally, I am one of about 20 people that have been awarded the uh, International Association of IT Asset Managers Fellow Award for life, and then I also uh, received a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009 for my work on uh, business service management and uh, uh, universal clients. Awesome. Thank you. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and dive into um, the, the basics of licensing and then get into licensing as a service. Um, so again, if you have any questions throughout the webinar on any of these slides or topics, please feel free to send those through the questions box. and and we'll go ahead and address those at the end of the webinar. Um, so Jeannie, if you want to go ahead and, and take it away. Sure. I, one of the key questions that comes up is, what exactly is licensing or is a license? A lot of people are aware that a license um, essentially is a contract between you and either a software provider or sometimes a hardware provider 
to either rent or to use in perpetuity um, their product or solution to solve a problem that you may have internally. And there are different types of licenses, and I think this is the important part that makes it very convoluted in this day and age. So there's perpetual licenses, which means that once you purchase that license, you can use it in perpetuity uh, until you end of life that particular license. And typically, there's some maintenance agreements that come into play to get updates and upgrades and support on the particular product or solution. There's a term-based license, which means that you're, like, you're renting it for a period of time. So for example, a very a uh, perfect example of that would be like salesforce.com. Typically, they'll do what they call a subscription, so you can subscribe for a given period. Maybe it's a year, or two years, three years. So you're paying every year to rent that particular license. Um, or there's unlimited licenses, right? So instead of paying by uh, the user or by the license used, you know, some companies have negotiated um, an enterprise-wide license agreement or an unlimited license. But the key thing with some of these licenses is you have to realize um, sometimes they are restricted to where you're, you know, either it's going to be on-premise in your uh, internal uh, use or it could be in the cloud. So there's different types of licenses there by location. You also can rent it by the drink. So for example, some um, technology providers provide that you can rent a given piece of uh, software for a, an hour or for a, a single use time. Um, a named user, right, so that you can rent it by, you know, or, or purchase it by this list of named users. But if additional users come up, you'd have to purchase new licenses for them. There's also licenses for systems or integration licenses. So license not just for the user, but maybe it's a system to a system, maybe it's an SAP talking to a salesforce.com. So the key is when you think about licensing, it's very complex because there's multiple types. Uh, there's multiple kinds. They are um, restricted by location, by user. Some aren't restricted. And so a lot of times, um, really understanding what you have from a licensing perspective can be very challenging for companies because those that are implementing the license aren't necessarily those that have purchased them. So there could be a discrepancy or disagreement. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Um, and so before we jump into the complexity of cloud licensing, um, in addition to the Salesforce example that you gave, which is uh, Salesforce is always such a great example <laughs> to use in almost any situation, um, what's another example you can give in, in terms of um, some of these different licensings that you see on, on a most regular basis? Like what, what are the most widely used ones and what would be another example in addition to Salesforce that people can can really grasp the concept. Well, there are, so different examples would be like Oracle. So for example, Oracle will license on a per operating system instance. Um, so per OSI, and a lot of times it's based on the hardware that it's attached to. So there are some restrictions there on um, not only the OSI, but are you running it on a virtual machine on Amazon? It's going to cost you more than if you're running it on, on Oracle's cloud. Um, another example could be um, like Microsoft Office subscription. So you could be limited to you know, how many users that you can have for a given subscription. Um, and you could have, and, and if you look at in the case of Microsoft, they have like three different types of licenses for the same type of, for the same software. So one could be cloud only, you're only going to use it on AWS or Azure. The other one could be enterprise only, you're only going to use it on premise on your private cloud. And then the third could be both, right? So there's really a lot of challenges or complexity there. Um, another example would be, for example, if you're doing um, this time of year, everyone has taxes, and you want to sign a single license so that you can do electronic signatures to e-sign your um, taxes to be able to send it in electronically to the, you know, the IRS. So there's lots of different ways that you can license technology, and I think that's the key. Um, and it really uh, depends on if it's a consumer-based license and how you purchased it, or if you've negotiated a different type of contract as an enterprise customer. Mm -hmm. Great. That's great. So, um, and then in regards to cloud license complexity, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, this was an image that I, I drew up to kind of explain why the cloud provides such complexity when it comes to licensing. 
So if you think about this day and age when people are doing a cloud only or a cloud first policy, or you look at the fact that you've got companies like analysts like IDC saying there's going to be over 50 billion Internet of Things devices coming online, you know, in the next few years. And when you look at all this, these different pieces that come into play, you realize that today the way that traditional IT silos work, it creates a lot of complexity to manage all these different licenses because they do come with different agreements depending on the company. So first you have the physical non-cloud. So you'll have the traditional legacy licenses like your Oracles, your SAPs, um, your database solutions or different solutions that you've already had on, on premise and your traditional legacy solutions to monitor or manage those particular assets are typically in place. So you'll have audit and governance asking questions like, are we in compliance? Um, do we have the right license regulatory pieces, particularly in this day and age when you have the global data protection ruling coming into play in May of this year? So audit is you know, becoming center and top of mind. In fact, it's one of the top three things that CIOs have told me have been a pressing issue for them. And then on the flip side, then you've got the IT engineering department, people trying to do DevOps, right? So they know they're just worried about, I've got to deliver these applications to these users. Maybe I've embedded or incorporated part of this Apache license in my code, but do I have the right license agreements for the users to be able to use it? For example, even if it's open source, there's some licensing pieces that come into play, right? Um, so they know that they need the extra servers, and they know that maybe they need to burst to AWS in order to make, for example, if you're like an Intuit right now, and you're trying to spin up additional um, virtual machines on AWS so that you can service this, you know, burst of new customers for tax season, right? So they're just worried about, do I have enough capacity to run the application to do what it needs to do? They don't necessarily always look at, do I have the right licenses to push it over to those different environments? Um, then in addition to that, then you've got the cloud broker, the cloud architect, right? So then they're trying to figure out, okay, I'm out of capacity. Who can I burst to? What can I burst to? What's the cost? And the cost not just in terms of you know the data, the Postgres, the egress that you're going to see on these third-party cloud providers, but it's also the ISP cost, the license cost, the visibility cost. Is it really going to be in compliance? A lot of times they may think that they're in compliance, but if there's no automated check, it makes it really hard for them to determine you know, not only can I technically burst, but legally should I? And then you've got the product managers on the business side. And they have to figure out um, whether it's the software vendor or it's the business themselves of, you know, how do I prevent license, license leakage to the cloud? If I'm the one responsible for this application component, how do I prevent it from being bursted out or used or maliciously um, taken off premise or license or copied or different pieces, right? Like I've seen some with the license server where literally if they just duplicate the server, they can duplicate the number of licenses. So if you have a thousand licenses, all of a sudden you, you can duplicate it and have 2,000 licenses. And then you have the managed service providers. Now these poor guys, they have to determine, okay, is it something that the enterprise customer actually brought with them in the infrastructure as a service piece, or is it something that they have to, put, they have to pay a service provider license agreement for? So they have to determine themselves, is this individual actually licensed, or, or not just individual, but the service workload licensed to be able to use these applications or these solutions or products in my cloud? Or do I have to charge them based on my agreements with the vendor as well? So as you can see, it's a very complex supply chain and a very complex right. problem from the business to the technology team to the, the partners as well, you know, working in the cloud. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. So that being said, what I mean, what, what would you say the biggest impact is, um, you know, from licensing on digital transformation in the cloud? Is it, is it the, from the services to the customers? Is it the compliance piece? Is it um, the actual infrastructure itself? Is it all of the above? It's cost, compliance, and agility, those three pieces. Cost, because you look at companies like Mars that have been settled up for $100 million because they couldn't prove in that period of time that they weren't using all the Oracle licenses on every piece of their private cloud. Um, compliance, because you're looking at everything from Sarbanes-Oxley to HIPAA to even GDPR, 
you know, as part of the um, control objective baseline for IT standards, require that you're in compliance with your license agreement, require that you're in compliance with the implementation uh, standards that you've agreed to and you're adhering to all the different pieces in place. And then um, agility because of the fact that it really slows down the system. So when people are looking at continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, if they're actually told that they can't implement or if they're like Anheuser-Busch who um, are being sued by SAP for $600 million for their use of integrating SAP to third-party cloud providers, then all of a sudden it's going to stall and slow down their implementation. And so mm -hmm. those three areas, it's significantly impactful. And because of this lack of visibility and these lack of checks, um, it becomes a real risk for many companies to undertake. And it really slows down their movement towards the cloud, and it really impacts a lot of these digital transformation efforts that people have in place today. It's just not everyone's talking about it. Right. OK. And so in the case of um, Mars Candy and, and Anheuser-Busch, and I think there was also the, the use case with the city of Denver, what could they have done in, in order to avoid that? What, what were some steps they should have taken? Well, some of the pieces are process components, right? So really looking to make sure that their contracts with these different vendors allow them to leverage the applications or the licenses with third-party clouds. That there are use cases, for example, that allow them to do have an integration license from one system to a third-party system, or use cases that allow them either to have an enterprise-wide license agreement that they can run that database on any piece of their private cloud um, technology, so renegotiating some of those contracts. And if they can't renegotiate the contracts, then either restricting the usage or limiting to a specific cloud cluster um, on premise, you know, or however the license reads. And then the, the alternative to that is leveraging some of the newer technologies that allow them to have real-time discovery and monitoring. Because a lot of the legacy-based discovery tools, um, they only do a time-based stamp. So even though, for example, if you're Mars, even though you didn't use the you know, Oracle on every piece of their VMware um, ESXi host, what will end up happening is they had no way to prove that they didn't within that given period of time between discovery pools. So they need to find alternative ways that they can actually show that they didn't lift and shift. So more checks and balances built into the systems themselves and more automation built into the systems themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So um, now we'll get into um, just a little bit about licensing as a service. Um, so if you want to give just a kind of a, a quick intro and background into really what that is, um, you know, and, and what it means, why it's important. Um, you know, it seems like we're, we're adding the as a service on the end of everything these days. So what makes licensing as a service legit? Why is it something that people need to consider as part of their digital transformation strategy? Absolutely. So licensing as a service is something I actually coined about six years ago. And the key was when I was looking at companies that were talking about cloud bursting and doing research for my books, one of the big gaps that I saw is that the licensing impacts every part of the stack, whether it's the application down to the infrastructure or the applications up to the users. So it was really important for companies to look at what they have and automate, provide some type of handshake so that from a centralized point, they can determine what their risks are from a cost compliance and agility perspective on a given license piece. And in many cases, what I found is that many companies already have everything that they need on premise, like they already have a license management tool with a product use rights library. They already have some form of discovery or log analyzer tools like Splunk, for example. And it was just a matter of them integrating the components together and putting in an automated check to determine not only can I, but legally, financially, should I um, lift and shift this given application or service workload or license component from one cloud environment to the other. And so that licensing as a service could just be as simple as a microservice that you integrate and you do a check from your cloud migration tool or a check from your vMotion or your automation tool, um, whether it's your private or public cloud, that really looks to see um, 
do I have the license rights to be able to lift and shift or move this workload? And then more importantly, when you're moving it to a third-party cloud like AWS or Azure um, or Rackspace or pick a cloud provider, that it's able to determine or prove that that was a license that you already had rights to to use, you know, for example, like Microsoft, that you have one that allows you to use it on the cloud as well as the enterprise license agreement. So it makes it a lot easier than having to manually try and track all this stuff because, frankly, the cloud moves too quickly and the manual processes that we used to use for change, incident, and problem management um, need to be automated and they're not necessarily going to work into the future. So where the licensing works as a service, is it's really um, a essential check that you have to make before you lift and shift a service workload from one location to the next. Got it. That's a great summary of it. Um, so now we'll, we have a few other questions um, that we'll go over. And just a reminder to the audience, um, if we do have any questions for Jeannie about licensing of service or licensing in general, please feel free to, to send those through the questions box. Um, so a couple here, um, Jeannie, why won't traditional licensing work for digital transformation and what are the steps for digital transformation in regards to licensing as a service? Well, traditional licensing, the way that it was set up and the traditional tools, if you think about it, were all set up from the infrastructure up. So if you look at like even your traditional discovery tools, they charge on a per operating system instance. And as a result of them charging on a per OSI instance, um, it, it kind of flies in the face of the whole cloud native or cloud model where everyone's trying to get to that software defined data center, right, where the users and the applications dictate the workload or the consumption of the underlying infrastructure. So in any given month, like, and we'll pick on Intuit again, they could be spinning up tens of thousands of virtual machines, spinning them up and spinning them down. Now, they don't want to have to pay on a per instance basis for each of those VMs that they're spinning up and down, what they want to pay on is what are the average number of virtual machines that I'm using for that given period of time. So what that's going to mean is if you look at these legacy solutions or tools, they're still going to do, you know, tie the license back to a per OSI instance. So the charges are going to exponentially grow. And then the other issue that's going to come into play, some of the newer licensing models aren't necessarily going to be reflected. So you're going to have issues there. And then you're also going to have issues with a lot of the by the drink um, term base that moves to perpetual that I've seen some providers put into place or newer license types that were born in the cloud aren't necessarily going to be represented. And so realistically, um, the legacy models will work for a short period of time if you're looking at migrating a service workload to a given um, cloud piece but not necessarily for the long term. So you really need to rethink that model and rethink those checks and then rethink about if you're going to have to integrate anyway instead of investing in a new platform built by a legacy provider, it might be better to, um, to create a licensing as a service microservice that can connect all these different data points together and give you that check that you're looking to do and save the money uh, right now uh, in particular, especially when you look at artificial intelligence, machine learning is going to be the prevalent piece that's going to drive this particular part of the market. And roughly in 2017, I was reading there's over $26 billion invested in acquisitions around that area. So you're going to see a lot more, but it's not there yet if it was just acquired. It's going to take two to three years for it to catch up. So I think the key thing right now is to build in some of the automation as part of your cloud service platform, your DevOps process with whether it's GitHub or Chef or Puppet or some of your existing tools, plugging into these legacy solutions um, versus reinventing the wheel or expecting them to understand some of the cloud-esque um, parts of it because they're not going to get all those pieces because they're attacking it from the existing way that they've invested in already today, right? Mm -hmm. And so in addition to um, some of those legacy solutions, how does this shift affect legacy licenses in particular? Well, how it affects legacy licenses is it's realistically understanding what you have set up um, with your vendors, right? So it's going to take, you know, really kind of, when I talk about in my latest book, um, I Speak Cloud Embracing Digital Transformation, making sure that you have the right people have a seat at the table. 
and really kind of looking at some of those legacy licenses and doing an aha moment saying, do I need to go back to Oracle or SAP or some of my legacy vendors and renegotiate my enterprise agreements to include cloud, to include um, you know, being able to connect to Salesforce to SAP and how that uh, works together, right? And the, the difference, I think, in the keys when you look at this particular piece um, on the, the bigger you know, scale of it um, with these legacy applications is understanding what you can and cannot do with them so that you do reduce or eliminate as much as possible the additional risk so you don't end up like an SAP or like a Mars Candy or City of Denver where you're paying not just millions but hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements that were not part of the budget. And that someone's, you know, it's going to, and not just, and you think about that as a settlement, but what about all the executive time and the, the additional hundreds of millions of dollars that it cost the company just to figure out what was going on for investigation, too, as well. Sure. Okay. Great. So um, we'll go ahead and move on to um, open it up for some questions from the audience. It looks like we've already had a couple come in. Um, so one that came in says, how does licensing as a service work on a per seat setup? Well, so the, I think the key is when you're looking at licensing as a service, you think of it as a microservice that you're going to need to create for your organization that is going to check and balance. So when you talk about a per seat setup, um, a per seat is a license that you have, you've paid per user, per seat, per named user. Um, for that particular piece. Those are the rules and regulations of your license. So those are the product use right components. Whereas licensing as a service is the microservice that will actually leverage all the different, um, you know, different proof points from discovery to log analyzers to looking at that product use right setup and telling you if you actually are licensed to do that or not. Or if you're above your threshold or if there are other risks that are coming to play like that license is being used on AWS or Azure in a different environment that it's not supposed to. So it's basically automating those checks and balances with your cloud um, service platform so that when you do go to migrate those license workloads from one system or cloud to the other or from one um, cluster or one to the other that you're actually um, you're licensed to do that, right? So it's not necessarily a per seat license perspective when you look at it from that that component. Like there are some some tools that are out there that are trying to sell, um, like sell you the platform, like they're going to create the platform for you, but a lot of it is based off of these legacy license postures that will be changing in the future, and I think that's important um, to understand that. Right. Okay. Great. Another question that came in, um, this user is asking, what is the difference between licensing as a service and software as a service? Well, they're two very separate things. Um, so when you think about software as a service can be on-premise, off-premise. Software as a service is typically something like uh, E911 directory or like um, Adobe eSignatures, right? It is a service that they set up that you can subscribe to to leverage a different application piece. And it could be internal, it could be external, it could be done from a vendor. But the, the key takeaway is uh, SaaS is independent of the underlying platform that it sits on. Licensing as a service could be set up as a software as a service component. Um, so that's one way to set it up. But the key takeaway when you look at licensing as a service is it's really creating that microservice or that handshake to automate um, making sure that you are licensed to leverage that service workload, that application, or even that SaaS-based component um, within your contracts for your company. Because most companies, especially at the enterprise level, they're unique. And it's scheduled or set up to be unique. So it's important that you automate that handshake so that there are less manual uh, mistakes that happen in the process. Sure. OK. So it, just, it really helps to streamline the, the implementation and the automation of these different applications. What's that? I'm okay. sorry. OK. Oh, I was just kind of um, summarizing. So it, the licensing as a service piece really just kind of helps to, to um, 
implement and kind of speed up automation of some of these different SaaS applications or, or enterprise apps that people are using. Exactly. And when you think about it, think of it like your post office. So your post office, every envelope, every package is, has an address. And it has a destination, and there's some postage due or wait and of where you can send this piece to or that piece to. So the, the licensing as a service component is really a microservice that does that handshake that makes sure that you know, if you're sending this, this letter to Germany or to this other location that you're going to pay the additional postage because maybe it's not part of the, the normal agreement that you have in place with your postal carriers right, for the, the freedom stamp. So really kind of looking at that bigger picture, it does that handshake. And it could be something that you create as part of your DevOps or as part of your development open source initiative, or it could be something that you decide to go to a third party to procure. But just knowing that when you do that or when they build it out, that you just you know, proceed with caution, that they need to be able to look at the different models, whether it's legacy for Platform 2 or cloud native models that have a, a, a different way of looking at things from the application and the user down into the system. Got it. Great. And then we have a, a couple other questions coming in. So this next one, this user says, storage requirements obviously looks like it will soon explode with IoT. Today some vendors are charging huge markups on cloud storage that they probably outsource to AWS or Google anyway. Have you seen deals where the client has their own storage agreements separate from the cloud licensing vendor? And if so, what are the challenges? Um, I have seen deals where people have, you know, they've pre-negotiated storage requirements, especially if you're looking at like with um, large vendors like AWS or Azure or Rackspace, you know, depending on, it, or if they do like what they call virtual private, um, you know, uh, network or virtual private cloud. So when you, when you look at that VPC, you can set up and have your own storage set up. You can have um, different pieces set up. And, Really, so some mm -hmm. of the vendors will charge extra if that's a SaaS base piece, right, or platform as a service component. So a lot of it is um, you don't get in life what you deserve, you get in life what you negotiate. Um, so there are going to be some challenges, like they'll push back, obviously, they'll want you to use their storage, they'll want you, they'll give you security or other reasons for that, but I think um, the key is cash is king, so if you have a big enough a requirement or agreement and you're able to calculate what I call the law of diminishing returns and I talk about this in, in my latest book as well of looking at what is that pivotal point from users to technology usage and threshold and storage where the costs you know, may not make sense to use on a third party cloud. You may want to take it in house. And I've worked with companies to kind of re reconfigure and calculate that piece where there's going to hit the law of diminishing returns where they may want to burst it back because it may not make sense to do the storage in the third-party cloud. Um, the other key component there, too, with some of the challenges or things to think about is the storage really exponentially increases when people are trying to build these big data lakes where they're trying to stuff everything into one environment, right? So the key is when you're doing discovery and when you're pulling back the data is to actually aggregate at the edge of the source of the data and then pull it back. Don't try and necessarily um, swallow the whole whale whole because you will choke on it but only take the incremental elements that you're going to need and then um, bring it back over so that it's more efficient uh, and then you'll reduce some of your impacts to storage as well. Okay, great. Um, another question from the audience. With Windows Azure uh, if Infrastructure as a Service concept, they asked to get our own licensing for Window uh, Cows. Does this licensing as a service, um, will it be helpful? And cost-efficient? Yes, so especially if you're doing infrastructure as a service, because whether it's Windows Azure or whether it's AWS or Rackspace or, you know, pick a different cloud vendor in place, of infrastructure as a service vendor, it is bring your own license, but it's also bring your own license at your own risk. And so you need to check to make sure that you are licensed for that technology on that infrastructure. And then more importantly, you know what the impact is going to be. So for example, if you look at Oracle, roughly in October of 2016, they actually doubled their license cost if you're running it on AWS or Azure. 
and you know customers had roughly about 60 days to come into compliance or pay the double tariff basically um, and in that case and it was a very quiet thing that was just you know put out and like here's a notice to customers and then you had to figure it out well in most cases it would take people 12 to 16 weeks to even figure out what they had out there but if you had a licensing as a service component set up already then you would know what you had you would look at what your risks are and then you would determine do I keep this license on this third-party cloud or do I burst it back internally right and the, the dirty little secret why most people haven't really perfected the art of bursting like it's usually a one-way migration or they're trying to do like a cloud only um, policy is because of the it's very convoluted and cloudy haha <laughs> Um, about what these licensing components are and the visibility, right? Like where does this workload actually belong and where do I pay the license for? So because of this issue, they're trying to work around it by doing one way all or nothing, right? Um, or not going to the third-party cloud or keeping it on-premise. So what LAST will do to answer your question is it will help you solve that issue and the big cost benefit that will come into play is you'll have visibility of, to the risk. Not only can I, but should I? And when do I need to burst back because it is going to cost me too much because I've I've reached that threshold of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And then um, looks like one other question came in from the audience. Um, if the cloud vendor has all your data stored, how does the client get permission to access their own data within the vendor's environment to run an independent data analysis? So that is a, um, a very complex question. I'll tell you why. One, it depends on the type of data. Uh, it depends on the type of data that they're collecting and who else the data impacts. So for example, if it's just your data and it just impacts your users or your customers, then typically as part of your agreement, data analytics, big data analysis would be part of that. And one of the things that I do usually recommend to people in, the, in those cases um, is to actually have uh, co content caching, so you actually keep a cache on premise. So if something does happen, you have a backup. And then use a secondary um, provider for backup and recovery so you always have access to your data. Uh, the, the other key thing is in order to get permission to have this access, the best way to do it is to negotiate it ahead of time. So again, you don't get in life what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. So make sure that when you're working with these third-party cloud providers, that the ability to move from one to the other, so a, you know, also known as keep your data, um, that it belongs to you, that you own the data, right? That's the key, because in some cases they own the data and they can mine it to do what they need to do, right? And then the secondary piece with this is where you have to be careful if you are a cloud vendor and you're asking your vendor, so from their perspective, they're multi-tenant environment. So they have a lot of different customers that because of privacy rules, because of regulations, because of the public accounting oversight board, PCAOB, um, what will end up happening is they have to prove that there are some restrictions there so that you know they're not allowing access, for example, to some of the underlying infrastructure or third parties' infrastructures that could um, necessarily have a negative impact where someone can infiltrate it or they can have a guest the host attack or different aspects of that. So they have to prove that they're in compliance as well with security risk and other uh, components for their other customers. So there's some data even if they want to, they're not going to be able to, um, to assist you uh, with allowing you to analyze it. So it really depends on what the data is. Uh, and the key here is what you, what you negotiate. Okay, and then um, one last question from the audience. It looks like um, this is about cost. So this user is asking um, if typically the upgrade of a license uh, with this licensing as a service model, does it have any cost benefits? For example, if someone were to upgrade from SQL 2016 to SQL 2018 in the future, does that typically come with a discount when you upgrade? Okay, so licensing as a service, I think the key here is to understand what it is, right? So licensing as a service is to check to make sure that you, that your procurement team and your operations team and your development team are all speaking the same language and you know exactly what you're licensed for and frankly what you're not. Um, what the individual discounts, the individual rules of what you've negotiated with Microsoft with SQL from 2016 to 2018, 
for upgrades and different pieces like that, whatever discounts you have with your vendors is not part of licensing as a service. Um, that is part of your agreement with those vendors. But now where it will give you a cost benefit in the future, and I think this is important, is if you look at the other key things is where the users located, what licenses are underutilized, right? So what are ones that I have? For example, one of the things when I set up a system like this is I looked at, um, you know, do I have all these server huggers where they have all these virtual machines on Amazon where they're, you know, checked out these licenses that frankly they're, not, they're being underutilized or not utilized at all? Can I pull those back when it's time to renegotiate, when it's time to upgrade, and really look at how many licenses am I actually using versus how many have I had deployed, how many are dev and test, how many are production, so that I have more visibility into what my real costs are and then I can negotiate a better deal. In some cases, um, I even negotiated even prior to the contract being ended because we weren't using all the subscription licenses, for example. So it's really kind of understanding what your license posture is versus um, dealing with an individual agreement between, like, say, Microsoft and your company. Right. OK. Great. I Hopefully that answers that question. Um, and then before we wrap up, um, I just wanted to, to note some key takeaways and then action items for the audience that's listening in. So um, obviously, you know, we've covered that um, licensing can be a challenge for cloud and digital transformation, and it's all about, you know, upgrading, um, not using legacy or, or yesterday's technologies um, in order to continue solving these problems. So what are some, what are some key takeaways and action items um, that the audience listening in can can take away from from this webinar and take back to their procurement and ops and devs teams and um, you know really to help kind of catalyze that digital transformation strategy. Well, the key thing is to have open up that dialogue or conversation. Have the right people have a seat at the table. Procurement, you know, DevOps operations. Um, the business understanding what those implications are. So if the business is going around IT and, and purchasing. SaaS-based or different subscriptions, understanding what those subscriptions are. For example, um, one large financial services institution I was working with, they discovered seven new contracts that they didn't know that they had. You know, so really kind of looking at um, making sure that the business is involved so they understand what the risks are. And then creating an automation process that looks at not just what the third party have put together, the standard product use rights, but what has your company actually negotiated and automating that in a checks and balances process as a microservice as part of your cloud service platform so that before they go to migrate, whether it's with like a um, Cisco clicker or, or looking at uh, VMware, Oracle, or all these different tools that allow you to lift and shift the workloads, that it's doing the proper system checks and balances to make sure not only can you, but should you. Um, the second thing is like, taking inventory to understand what you have. So first you get everyone together, you map it. After you map it, then you look at um, migration. And then um, you know, before you go to migrate, you optimize. So what are you using? What aren't you using? It's kind of like you want to clean your refrigerator before you go out and you buy new food. Um, make sure that you know what that license posture is. And don't just depend on traditional discovery tools but really look at real-time monitoring tools, tools like Tachyon or Tanium, tools like um, you know, uh, SignalFX, uh, Karthik Rao had come from VMware. He understands the cloud very well so that you're getting a real-time of what's not only deployed but what's being used. Harvest those pieces back and then make sure that all that, those components are automated right, so that you have real visibility and control into your, your cost and your risk and your compliance and your infrastructure, I think, is the critical success factor here. Awesome. And then finally, um, yeah. don't fly blind, um, meaning that um, if people go to ask you, you know, how do I justify this, like your CFO or, you know, looking at um, security or different elements within the company itself, is, you know, you, you know, basically Google Mars Candy. Uh, there's lots of public records about the lawsuit with Oracle and Mars or Anheuser-Busch or the city of Denver and show that it's not just, you know, it's, it's not just something that isn't going to happen or that because everyone's clicked through. It's something that is very real and people are, you know, paying the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars to address some of these discrepancies. So really understanding what your biggest risks are with the 20% of applications that are 
going to more than likely audit like Adobe or Oracle or SAP or, or some of the bigger guys and make sure that you have your checks in place and you're protected, I think is the final takeaway as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That is fantastic. Um, so it looks like that's all the questions we have from the audience. Just a quick reminder um, to anybody listening, if you want to get involved with the series, feel free to reach out to me, kharris at brighttalk.com. Um, if you have any other questions, either for myself or Jeannie, and you um, want to continue the conversation offline, um, feel free to reach out to, to both of us. Um, and Jeannie, I, I want to thank you very much for your time today. Um, really appreciate your insight and expertise, and um, I'm sure it was very valuable to the audience as well as for me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.